Day 27, Tuesday, June 1st, 1937, seven days until the eclipse. Up early and to breakfast of toast and coffee. Tidied up my tent and cot and got squared away to go over to the ship. Went over about nine o'clock and got all the letters addressed and stamped so that they will be sent in time. The captain and I chatted for a while and it was time for lunch. It was really nice to eat aboard when you had a tablecloth under your plate and where there was an atmosphere of home, which is noticeably lacking about the camp. Left the ship in time to get here for the broadcast at 3.30. On a large, low atoll in the Pacific Ocean, just this side of the international date line, a group of men is stationed. Its members form the National Geographic Society United States Navy Eclipse Expedition, now within one week of observing the rare phenomenon of a total solar eclipse. In this broadcast tonight, we are sending them a word of cheer and good luck, together with some entertainment and music. And we would like you to participate, in spirit at least, in this program, which we direct to the expedition exiles on lonely Canton Island. Well, our first reminder of home and hecklers is a little sonata that has to do with Manhattan's greenery and graystone. I call it Slumming on Park Avenue. Norman? <laughs> We think that you'll be happy indeed to meet and turn your heads to hear Miss Carol Wyman, one of NBC's nicest interpreters of a nice mood in a nice song. Carol Wyman sings, Where Are You? Nice indeed, Carol. Through the courtesy of the Press Radio Bureau, we send the highlights in the news of the day to the expedition. The following news is from the Press Radio Bureau as compiled from the reports of the Associated Press, United Press, and Universal Service. All over the world tonight, moves are being made to maintain peace in Europe outside the borders of Spain. United States Ambassador William Dodd visited high German officials in Berlin today and pleaded the wisdom of keeping cool during Europe's latest threat of a general war. America's famous woman flyer is resting overnight at San Juan, Puerto Rico tonight. She flew there from Miami today on the first lap of her flight around the middle of the world. She will take off from San Juan tomorrow to Dutch Guiana on the east coast of South America. And now let's read a few messages from friends and relatives from members of the Eclipse Expedition, friends and relatives who could not be with us tonight in our studio. To Dr. S.A. Mitchell... Here's a message from his brother, W.A. Mitchell, in Kingston, Ontario. Best wishes and good luck from Brother Bill and Clary and his sister Emma. Here's a note to Lieutenant H.A. Gross, the United States Navy medical officer. Greetings and aloha from Honolulu. Looking forward to your return. Lou and Peggy in excellent health. Love from Mrs. H.A. Gross, Honolulu. Now for a very pleasant surprise for announcer George Hicks. We present Mrs. Hicks, who will say a word of greeting to her husband. Anna? Hello, George. We are both well but lonesome. It is hot in New York, and Ivan has been in sunsuit. Yesterday, he said, if you don't come home soon, it will be winter. May I wish you and the party all the luck for June the 8th. Goodbye. <laughs> To the strains of the National Geographic March, we go to the National Capitol for a continuation of our program. On to Washington. Here in the nation's capital, we have all been awaiting to send our special greetings to Canton Island. Gathered in the studio are more dear ones of some of the members of the expedition, so many thousands of miles away, but through the magic of radio so near to us. The next message is from Barbara Stewart daughter of Richard H. Stewart, representative of the National Geographic Society, to her father. Hello, Daddy. This is Barbara. I'm in the National Broadcasting Studio in Washington with Mother and Betsy. Dickie is at home. We're, we were so excited and glad to hear your voice Sunday night. 
all of us are well. Dickie doesn't have any more teeth. You may not know it, Daddy, but you're buying me a bicycle. You know you promised one to me if I graduated from school this year. Well, I'm graduating. Mother is buying the bike right away. <clears throat> and all you have to do now is to pay for it. Daddy, we want you to enjoy your swim in the lagoon. But please be mighty careful of the sharks. Lots of love from Mother, Dickie, Betsy, and me. Goodbye. And now Keith Willis, son of John E. Willis, astronomer of the U.S. Naval Observatory, is in the studio and has a greeting for his father. Hello, Daddy. This, this is Keith. I'll be glad when you get back so that I won't have to walk to school. Audrey came out Sunday and we went out strawberry picking. We also made some new swings at Pine Grove. I'll try to hear you the next time you are on the air. Dr. Gross, it has fallen to my lot to answer your SOS for the meaning of zero fitting and to try to stave off those mental cases. It seemed a pretty tough assignment at first because, whether by design or otherwise, you slipped in a Y as the second letter instead of an E. But it is our boast here that we always get our word. So here is the meaning of your term, and may heaven help the radio waves. Quote, zero fitting, pertaining to plants structurally adapted for growth with a limited water supply. The term is also applied to plants growing in salt marshes or lagoons where the imbibition, I hope that word gets to you intact, where the imbibition of water through the roots is slow or difficult. End quote. The dictionaries seem to indicate that in applying zero fitting to fish and finances, you are just a bit off the literal reservation. But it's too good a word to lose. I hope you tame it and bring it back alive, along with Dr. McNally's specimens. We do not know how much news of the world you temporary inhabitants of Canton Island are getting, especially news of science. Forty-two men are now living on the ice at or near the North Pole. They are Russians who flew there recently in four large planes from Rudolph Island. The idea is to establish a weather station at the Pole and leave a party of four men there for a year to radio temperature and other data back to Russia and the rest of the world. And now before signing off, let me, on behalf of the officers and staff of the National Geographic Society, offer the earnest wish that you will have a perfect day on June 8th. In other words, we hope the day will be zero fitting. And that's all from Washington. We hope you at Canton Island have received us well. And now to continue the program, let's return to New York. Now may we say once again, as we said last week, good night and good skies on June the 8th. This program, which was relayed to the Eclipse Expedition through the cooperation of RCA Communications, was a Blue Network presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and came to you from the RCA building in Radio City. <laughs> It was a really touching ceremony to hear greetings from our folks. My eyes were just a little bit wet after they read your message, and I felt very lonesome. The boys whose wives and children spoke reacted in much the same way. The program was much too short. It actually was the shortest half hour of the day. The two expeditions quickly became friendly. The officers of the Wellington entertained the members of both scientific parties and officers of the Avuk Church aboard their ship and later the scientists of both expeditions entertained each other on shore. As soon as the broadcast was over, we all went over to HMS Wellington and had some cocktails. I took my share of the drinks and had a very good feeling of well-being when we left. The cocktails were a Tahitian specialty of rum, lime juice, and soda, and they were very palatable. Came back ashore about 6 o'clock and had supper. The usual talk afterwards and then to bed after reading a couple of short stories in an old Liberty magazine. Day 28, Wednesday, June 2nd, 1937. Six days until the eclipse. Up and after the usual breakfast of hotcakes and coffee, 
went down to the waterfront to watch the boys work on the boxing ring, which is to be used in this afternoon's field day. The ship is giving a smoker for the men of the Wellington, and it should prove to be a very gala affair. There is to be a running broad jump, three-legged race, pie-eating contest, cracker-eating contest, songs and boxing matches. I took a trial run and jump on the broad jumping lane and made a pretty good leap, and to prevent falling backwards and spoiling a pretty good effort, I fell sideways and landed on the coral right on my tailbone. Gosh, what a jolt. It darn near knocked me out. This just in, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Amelia Earhart continues her around-the-world adventure aboard her Lockheed Electra aircraft with her navigator, Fred Noonan. Earhart will be flying to a few stops in South America before her leap across the Atlantic Ocean to Africa. The field day was a huge success. I wish you could have seen the pie-eating contest which a sailor from HMS Wellington won. George Hicks was announcing the events over loudspeaker, and when he asked the limey if he had anything to say, he replied by saying, I want more pie. I think that was real humor coming from a limey. All the men were served cold drinks of pineapple juice and orange juice, and they were all given a package of cigarettes and a piece of candy. And there was a distinct feeling of friendliness as soon as the party started, and there was more of it when the party ended. Even the captain of the Wellington led the men in, giving three cheers for the Avocets. Everyone seemed to have enjoyed himself, and I think it was an especially good idea for a moment of relaxation. Captain Helweg, Father McNally, and myself have been invited to the Avocet to have dinner with Williamson and the two Limey officers. A field day ashore for the enlisted men of the two ships was a complete success. Well, we had a nice dinner aboard the Avocet. We got over in plenty of time and sat around until the Limeys came over and then set about for a while, during which time we were served tomato juice cocktails. Far cry from the wonderful cocktails we had aboard the Wellington the day before. No one seemed to mind the difference, least of all myself. We had chicken, potato chips, peas, mashed potatoes, ice cream, and demitasse. We sat around till 10.30, chinning and spinning yarns, and then left to come back to the camp. It was dark as pitch, and Captain Williamson had to stand in the bow with a long-range flashlight and give the coxswain a flash in either direction so he could stay in the channel. I'd sure hate to be spilled out into that channel with all those vicious sharks waiting for a nice, juicy meal. Day 29, Thursday, June 3rd, 1937, five days until the eclipse. Up early and busy about the camp. After breakfast, one of the boys came back and said that he had waylaid a large sea terrapin and turned it over on its back so that it couldn't get away. It was a huge thing, and the strength it possessed in its forward flippers was actually phenomenal. I'd hate to be hit by one of them. We took some pictures of it, and then we killed it, hoping to get some good turtle steaks. But even after I made a very careful dissection, the only meat was around the extremities, and I doubted whether that would have been very palatable. Nevertheless, we took some of the meat back to camp, but the cook said that he couldn't use any of it. One of the boys brought back the huge shell and busied himself the rest of the afternoon by cleaning off the remnants of the tissue on the inside. He wants to take it back as a souvenir. I had been feeling rather blue all day and certainly was in no mood to be entertained or entertaining at dinner. You see, we invited the New Zealanders to have dinner with us last night, and as far as I was concerned, the whole thing was a flop. We did have a nice dinner of chicken and oyster dressing and finished up with pumpkin pie, but it could not have ended too soon for me. As soon as they left, I crawled into my bunk and read for a while. Day 30, Friday, June 4th, 1937. Four days until the eclipse. Had a dandy night's sleep and up early this a.m. to see an overcast sky, one that won't be so good if it occurs on the morning of June 8th. Had a breakfast of bacon and eggs, the eggs are really ripe now. I am getting damn sick and tired of this, and I shall be very happy to come home and really go to work again. There hasn't been a damn thing for me to do professionally. A month's leisure is certainly plenty for any man. If you were here, it would be a lot different. Perhaps my desire to go home would then be lacking. At any rate, I certainly am filled up on this place, and with most everyone, I feel sure the feeling is the same. Men are starting to find fault with their neighbors. This little trait, and that little trait, that a man may exhibit grates them, 
so that you would think a serious personal insult had been committed, practiced counting out the seconds several times in the morning, and then went shell hunting with the captain. We were gone only a short time when a severe shower came up and rained quite hard for the better part of the afternoon. The rain wouldn't be so bad because the soil quickly absorbs anything in the way of liquid, but the wind blows so hard that our temporary domiciles are in jeopardy all the time. As I told you before, the stakes of our tents are driven in the coral, and it doesn't take much force to shake them loose. Our mess tent almost went over last night, and it was only because of the combined efforts of several of us held the guy lines that it didn't completely blow away. We would have been in an awful jam without a place for our breakfast. The weather continues badly for a successful day on the 8th, Personally, I'd just as soon we'd pack up now, but I can concede the point that a whole lot of money and effort has been expended, so for that reason I hope that next Tuesday will be bright and clear and that all the scientists have great success in their undertakings. Day 31, Saturday, June 5th, 1937, three days until the eclipse. Well, Dick Stewart is down feeling pretty bad. He has diarrhea and a temperature of 101 and feels very nauseated. Gave him some paragoric and some bismuth subnitrate, codeine and aspirin, and he should get along all right. Took a swim before lunch and then a nap after lunch, but only got in about an hour, and then to counting the second for the eclipse time. Captain Helweg is to be at the telescope, and as soon as the eclipse is total, he gives a signal, and I start counting. I shall count for one minute, and then he'll count for one minute, and then I'll finish the rest of the count. That will give me a chance to see what a total eclipse is like. Day 32, Sunday, June 6th, 1937, two days until the eclipse. Dick Stewart is much better this morning and is able to be up and about. I find that several more men have come down with diarrhea, but I am at a loss to know what is causing it. It certainly isn't food because only an occasional man is involved. Dunham, Helweg, Willis, Stewart, and the cook Will Scam have been attacked out. Their symptoms are rather slight. Just a diarrhea of four to eight with no nausea or vomiting. That is, except Will Scam. I find that one man of the New Zealanders has been involved, so that gets us away from the possibility of it being a food condition. This morning, the weather is cloudy again, and at eclipse time, the clouds completely covered the sun. Everyone is rather down in the dumps about it, but maybe all this bad weather will have run its course, and we shall have high skies on next Tuesday morning. Everyone continues to work, though, and get his instruments in the best possible condition. I hope for them that we have a good day. As for myself, I would just as soon pack up and go home now. If there is no visible eclipse, we shall get home a day sooner because we won't have to wait around until all the films are developed. Of course, that is a rather selfish motive on my part. If we only knew beforehand, we could pack up and leave now. George Hicks came down with diarrhea today, but he blames it upon too much beer that he consumed aboard the Limey ship last night. No one else seems to have come down with it, and the condition does not seem to be very bad. I am not worried about anyone, and I feel sure that all they are going to come down with it have already come down. We went over to the New Zealand camp for a few minutes to drink a glass of ale with them. They have to leave soon after the eclipse and they didn't drink all their ale up, so they have asked us to come over and help them get rid of it. Day 33, Monday, June 7th, 1937, the last day before the eclipse. Well, today is the last day before the eclipse. Got up early this morning and to a hearty breakfast of hot cakes, syrup, and coffee. Everything is at the height of tenseness in the camp. We have been having a lot of bad weather, and there is much conjecture as to whether we shall be able to see the eclipse tomorrow. We went through rehearsals several times this morning and everyone seems to be all set and ready for the party. There is a sense of tension that is hard to describe. I think if you listened in on the program this afternoon, you could get some idea of the feverish activity of the moment. Here the stage is all set and all the work that has been done for the past month will be all for naught, unless we have clear skies. The day before the eclipse found us worried. The pessimists said we might as well pack up at the same time. The optimists thought everything would be all right. The rest of us hoped for the best. I was out in the sun all morning and was so interested in what was going on that I forgot to put on my hat and sunglasses. And this afternoon, I felt miserable. Had a sick headache 
and I tried to lie down and let it ease off, but it was so darned hot and sticky that I think I felt worse for lying down. After the sun was well down, I got up and went in for a little swim. I didn't swim much because each stroke I took, I thought the top of my head was going to come off. I went through two rehearsals, and now everything is in readiness for the big show tomorrow. Calling America. Canton Island calling. George Hicks of the National Broadcasting Company with the National Geographic Society, United States Navy Eclipse Party reporting from the South Sea Island. We stand on the day before the eclipse of the sun. In 18 and a half hours, the black moon's face will move before the sun. The dark will sweep over us, will be upon us for a fateful three minutes and 33 seconds. Even now, you can hear the gasoline engine which runs the air conditioning plant for these rooms. You can now probably hear Dr. Gross, the naval surgeon with us, who with Captain Helwig, are the second talliers counting out a rehearsal for one of the scientific units. The Captain Frederick Helwig, superintendent of the Naval Observatory, who is assisted by Mr. Willis of the observatory. Are you ready? to make your important time-checking observations of the eclipse tomorrow. Yes, Mr. Hicks. We have been ready for over a week. Dr. McNally and Mr. Willis are all prepared to make a long series of accurately timed photographs of the phases of the eclipse as it progresses. They will take about 90 photographs. Dr. Gross and I will time the contacts, count time for all instruments transmitting it through the loudspeakers, make chronograph comparisons, and I shall make the visual observation of the eclipse, which will supplement the photographic record. Uh, Captain, we've had bright, windy, hot, clear days up until this Friday. And then we had that wind and rainstorm, and since then our weather has changed completely for the first time. Uh, the wind has died out, and uh, there's practically no air now. Uh, but what's more important, the sky is almost completely veiled with great masses of gray-white cloud fields, which will hide the sun tomorrow if they're there. With your 37 years of sea experience, could you prophesy at all what the weather is now leading to? No, Mr. Hicks. It is a very difficult thing to predict weather conditions. We haven't been here long enough to know the local conditions. The gradual change for the worst during the past week is not at all reassuring. There are four prominent groups of sunspots plainly visible. Basing an estimate on previous eclipses, the presence of these large sunspots should have a definite effect on the shape of the corona tomorrow. But whether we are to have a clear view of the eclipse tomorrow, or whether we will have to view it through a haze, or have it interfered with by clouds, no one can predict. Our hopes are high. And if the visibility tomorrow is as high as our hopes, it will be the most wonderful eclipse ever seen. Now, partly in the shanty and partly before it, facing the flat water of the lagoon, is an amazing and intricate detail of mirrors, electric motors, cameras, reflectors, and automatic controls from the famous Mount Wilson Observatory. This apparatus is a new development which we hope may prove a step forward in future eclipse study. They will get corona photographs, spectroscopic records, movies of spectrum, and we hope in a new way. The Dr. Theodore Dunham, Jr. of Mount Wilson, assisted by Mr. Thompson of the Foundation for Astrophysical Research of New York, have been working night and day over this apparatus. Good night, and wish us good luck tomorrow. George Hicks announcing these eclipse programs reach you via ACA Communications, all facilities of the National Broadcasting Company. Did you hear me counting out the seconds on the broadcast today? A little local atmosphere or sound effects, as we say in radio. George worked real hard to put on the show. I think this camp is going to be torn down in a hurry. I'm wagering four to one that we get underway for Honolulu by Wednesday evening. I think the boys will all work like the devil to get all the equipment put aboard so that we can all get back home as early as possible. The only thing that will hold us up is the developing party. You see, most of the films that these men take have to be developed and dried right here so that there won't be any decomposition of the emulsion and give them a wrong reading. Well, I think this will be all for now. I think I have raved on enough, and I hope I have given you the impression of the tenseness of the atmosphere in the camp. This will be all for now, sweetheart. It will only be another 48 hours, and I shall be on my way home to see the sweetest girl and finest babies in the world. <laughs>